Well, our faith and friends producer Jennifer Beck is quite busy this time of the year working on TV44 auction related tasks. So we're bringing you three special interviews with Dr. Trudy Pieper in place of this week's show. Increasing brain power, natural supplements to help those with autism, and we'll discuss painkillers, talking about the opiate crisis and alternatives to the prescription painkillers, options that are not habit forming. Today's health topic, increasing brain power. How many of us need more brain power? I'm sure every single one of you at some point in the day thinks, oh, I'm gonna grab that cup of coffee. Are there other ways, natural ways, ongoing ways that you can help your brain function better? Dr. Trudy Pieper from Phoenix Wellness Center joins us again this week to talk about that very topic. How's your brain doing? Is it rearing and ready to go? It always is. I'm drinking my green tea like crazy. <laughs> I've had my coconut oil this morning. I'm ready to give some good thought and information today. All right, so share with us some of your nuggets, golden nuggets on how we can improve our brain functioning. You know, I think that if we just focus on the fact that there's lots of things in our home that we can do and we just have to be intentional. It doesn't happen. If you wanna increase your brain power, you can do that, but you have to make some lifestyle choices to make that happen. There's three easy things, and it's gonna be black tea, ginger, and coconut oil. Um, most are readily available. If you're not used to coconut oil, it may be something you're gonna run out the store and get after we finish talking mm -hmm. here today. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is black tea. We know that our IQ uh, stays the same, you know, once we test are tested for that. However, once you be, have dementia and, and Alzheimer's, your IQ lessens. You, it's just not as powerful, the number isn't as high, you can't function as well. So if you wanna maintain that IQ, you also want to increase your focus and your attention. You need to be drinking black tea every day. The Journal of Nutritional and Neuroscience uh, founds that it helps prote protect our intelligence level. It is, and we often think about black tea of having caffeine and mm -hmm. causing jitters, and maybe we can't think. The, the truth of that is it contains something called tannins, mm -hmm. which will lessen the jitters and L-theanine, and L-theanine is a wonderful calming uh, agent that helps with our neurotransmitters to allow us to have a calmer brain and allow signals to jump across the synapses in our brain. Mm. So L-theanine is in the black tea. Uh, studies have found that if you drink black tea uh, within 20 minutes, you will have, you'll do better on cognitive testing. Wow. So you're in college, getting ready for finals, you need to be drinking black tea before you're testing to Un make sure. Unsweetened. Unsweetened. Now, you can put a little honey in that, uh, or a little stevia, some natural vegetable sweetener, if you have to do that, because honey is a natural antibiotic, and I'm always concerned about people's immune system, so a little honey would be okay. But obviously, without it is best. <laughs> All right, black tea, that's your number one item that you wanna add to your list for your brain function to improve. Next one is? Ginger. Ginger. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it helps with your working memory um, and your reaction time. There was this two month study with, that was done in the Journal of Pharmacy and Pharmacology and it found that ginger has an ingredient called gingerol and it ups the flow of blood and oxygen into the brain. It calms stressed adrenals. It protects the blood brain barrier and it will al allow you to respond quicker. So you sometimes you have a hard time finding that word mm -hmm. and you're thinking about what it is I need to do next or my mm -hmm. foggy thinking, I don't know what direction to go. If you're using ginger every day, that will eliminate those problems. It's best to use fresh ginger and you peel the bark off of it and you grate a little bit off. You need one teaspoon of grated ginger a day will improve your, your thought process, your foggy thinking, and your memory. You can, and be creative with that. You can put it in tea, make a tea out of it. Um, I like to put it with my salads in my salad mm. dressing, a little zip to the dressing, um, in yogurt, sprinkle on some fruit. Um, ginger can be used anyway. And of course, we're talking about, you find it in your produce section. A lot of times it's next to where the fresh herbs will be found. It, 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 it looks like a, well, it comes in all shapes and sizes. It does. You're gonna buy Each this funny looking. brown, funny looking. Root. Yes, it's a root. It's a root. Take it home, and like she said, you take off the peel and that, and you can, you can use that inside. Great. If that sounds like too much work, you can buy the ginger powder, and you can use that instead but we always know fresher is better mm -hmm. and you get more of the insides and ingredients in the fresh ginger root. Oh, and once you, you uh, uh, 
even cutting it, just the aroma that good. comes out. Wow, yes. I'm a ginger fan, I can tell you that. Coconut oil is another fan. I'm another fan of that too. Coconut oil can be used in so many ways. It can, it's a good uh, omega-3s. We talk a lot about the essential fatty acids and how they give your brain, but it, re it improves recall. The Journal of Neurology and Aging found that just a single dose will help your recall ability. Mm. Um, again, we think about things and we can't remember what it was we were trying to say. Uh, it improves the memory of patients with dementia and Alzheimer's within 90 minutes. Mm. So they did cognitive testing with dementia and Alzheimer patients. They gave them uh, one to three teaspoons of the coconut oil, uh, mixed it in some coffee, put it in, um, or just gave it to them straight, and they found that uh, they responded within 90 minutes, they had better testing uh, after, after taking the coconut oil. It provides healthy fats, something called MCTSs, which are fast acting and will get into the brain. Um, they're really readily absorbed. It takes one to three teaspoons a day. Of the unrefined, okay, the unrefined. one that looks like lard. Now mm. that ages me. Not, a lot of people don't even know what lard <laughs> looks like, but it's white and chunky. Um, that's the, the form that is the best form that will use to improve your memory. You, I like to spread it on my toast instead of butter. Um, you can add in your smoothies, uh, put it in your tea. So there, if you put it in your black tea, then you have a double dose. You get to have two Perfect. ways of improving your mind and your memory. And where should people look? Where should they go to find this unrefined coconut oil? It, it obviously, it's at health food stores, but even the major grocery stores, Chief and Kroger, all have it in their health food section. And it comes usually in a glass jar, and again, it's, it's the thickened white uh, form is the one that you want. Okay. Now, why, why are we even having to have these conversations? Why are we Americans in such dire need of these types of things added to our diets? Well, in, in America, we think we're such a healthy nation with a great health care system. And we, there were just recent statistics that came out and to show that we are not. Mm. Um, we are number 34 as far as healthiest nations in the world. Number 34. 34. Number 34. Number one is Italy. Yes. Number two is Iceland. Switzerland, Singapore, and Australia are the top five. But yes, United States, number 34, and pretty up there in the world of obesity, too. It's huge. Um, we're always surprised with that. No, the number that we're really good at, Jennifer, is c cost. Hmm. We, we spend more for health care in the United States than any other country in the world, hmm. probably by almost three times as much. Wow. The uh, per capita cost is around $10,000 per person. For us in the United States. In the United States. Whereas in Italy, which is the healthiest nation, um, they spend 3000 a year. So it's, it's a huge difference of what it is. Um, obviously, I think from my perspective that we need to revamp and relook at how we're doing things that maybe uh, all of the prescription drugs in lieu of herbs and lifestyle changes may not be the way to go. Um, that herbs uh, is the main uh, medical system for 80% of the world. 80% of the world only uses herbs and lifestyle mm -hmm. changes, not drugs. So we're pretty much the primary user of the drugs in our country. The $3.3 trillion a year are spent in the United States on health care. The majority of that goes to hospitals, next to doctors, and then finally to the, the pharmaceutical companies. Wow. So um, it's things that uh, we can change. Uh, one of the things I think, okay, now why do we think that Italy has such a great health system? What are they doing different than we're doing? What do you think? Well, they, uh, they live closer to the water. <laughs> 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 yes, at, least for, at least closer than we do here in Ohio. And because of that, they eat more fish. Uh, and fish has essential fatty acids, which we mention a lot, um, are great for the brain. But they have the Mediterranean mm. um, diet, which is based upon the Medi Mediterranean Sea. And with that diet, which is also the diet that the Arthritis Foundation recommends for, for arthro arthritis people, particularly rheumatoid arthritis, if you follow the Mediterranean diet, that you will have less symptoms with your RA. But the big difference there is when we look at on a daily schedule of what you eat in the Mediterranean diet, you eat three fruits a day and you eat three cups of vegetables a day. Mm -hmm. Now three cups, knowing that a half cup is a serving, would be actually six servings of vegetables and three servings of fruits. 
So you're getting nine servings of fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. every day. The average American does one serving hmm. of either fruits or vegetables each day. Wow. So that makes a huge difference right there, why they're number one and we are not. They also put a lot of uh, emphasis on olive oil. They have olive oil with two of their meals. So either it's on a salad or they stir fry their vegetables in it. They cook only with the olive oil. And olive oil, besides being an essential fatty acid, also helps the liver and the gallbladder to work better. So now they're eliminating excess estrogens. They're uh, making the liver being able to purify the blood more quickly. Um, so the olive oil is another huge piece of that. They, the red meat's very limited. They do fish three to four times a week, and then otherwise they're doing poultry um, with their meals. Lots of grains, and that's not the white bread that we eat, but the crusty uh, <laughs> seeds and multi-grain breads that gives you lots of fiber. They also consume one ounce of nuts or seeds every day. Mediterranean diet, you can look that up online and you can find all of those statistics that Dr. Trudy just mentioned. These lifestyle changes may feel major, especially if you think, oh, that's such a huge change. Well, let's start with just one. Let's start with one lifestyle change, little by little. And as you add that into your life, you can add one more. And before you know it, six months down the road, you may look back and not only feel better, but realize so many things in your life have improved, including your brain. You'll be able to think better as well. Dr. Trudy Pieper, as always, thank you so much for your knowledge. Appreciate you being with us here on Faith and Friends. You can find her at Phoenix Wellness Center in Johnstown. There's the phone number 740-616-9949 or online phoenixwellnessforyou.com. We are joined by Dr. Trudy Pieper from Phoenix Wellness Center, making the trip up to Lima once again. Trudy, thank you for joining us here to, to talk about a topic that's near and dear to your heart, heart autism. Yes, it is. Um, it's always exciting to be here. Um, autism is something that, as you've mentioned, is very special to me. Um, I raised a child with autism. Mm -hmm. uh, he's now 40 and doing very well, but through the years to watch uh, how he's progressed and how far we've come with being able to help children with our autism and now adults, it, it's been very important. And that's what I love, the, the CAM treatment. It is for complementary and alternative medicine that can help treat overall health and potential behavioral problems as well. Uh, there's, there's so many different things we can help our children with autism, uh, one, one of which is dietary differences, things we can change dietary. Right, and with CAM, it, it's great because it, it complements uh, medicine today. Yeah. And probably almost 90% of parents who have children with autism have found that one of the complementary or alternative treatments really helps. And, and as you mentioned, um, diet is a huge one. Uh, this, there's a recent study that came out in February that focused on teenagers with autism okay. and found that they were in the hospital emergency rooms four times more wow. than their peers. Hmm. And uh, the study uh, done at Penn State University found uh, that maybe prevention is not being used as a tool to help these kids. And that it's easier to run them to the emergency room than think about how could we prevent some of the symptomatic problems that they're having. Yeah. And diet is one of those things that makes a huge difference. Uh, in particular, I think, uh, I know he's with my own son and seeing a lot of my patients with autism, mm -hmm. sugar, now, that's for all kids. I know with your kids. Yeah, you're right about that. Do you notice the difference when you're on a sugar high? Right away. Yeah. Well, and with autism kids, it's even more pronounced. Huh. So there's a fluctuation between overstimulation from the sugar, which then makes them more irrational, uh, stronger willed, more behavior problems, which will end them up in the ER. And then the other thing is, of course, what happens after they've been eating all the sugar and they don't have it? their blood sugar drops, crash, yeah. there's a crash, and that could cause dizziness and foggy thinking, mm -hmm. and they can't think clearly, and they're upset and more grumpy, and those will also end up. So by restricting sugar in the first place, and making sure that if your child has autism, that they're very limited amounts, um, even during special holidays, like the Easter season where they, right. and we're coming up on the holidays throughout the year that we, you know, oh, it's a treat. Well, sometimes that'll end up causing you to have a, a trip to the emergency room. So sugar is a universal one. What are some other things that, you know, we might need to test out and say this, this could or could not affect our children? Well, another big one is gluten. Okay. And almost all um, kids with autism um, have a gluten insensitivity. Okay. 
and it's one of those things you need to trial and error and test right. and see. But they find that after they eat gluten, there is a, they find a stronger behavioral uh, tendencies. Oh, wow. So they're going to react more strongly because of the gluten in their system. Mm -hmm. Another big one um, is dairy or cow's milk. Okay. Uh, it also it contains a, a protein called A1 um, casein. And that will also trigger a major behavioral issue oh, wow. in children. Okay. So watching that. Also, the cow milk also causes constipation. And probably the number one problem for autism or kids with ADD or ADHD, mm -hmm. that why they're more angry or more mean or upset or harder to discipline is because they're constipated. It's the oh, wow. number one problem with autism kids is really? constipation. And I find almost universally it is dairy is the issue. Because okay. today we put cheese on everything. We do. It's, it's just a cheese world and that's dairy and that's a problem for them. Huh. Um, and a couple other things though, and, and this not only is for autism kids, but I think for everyone, okay. kind of like the sugar, yeah. are the, the food additives and colors. Oh, yeah. So food dye, red number three, <laughs> nobody should have that. Why is this even in existence? <laughs> yeah, That's I what know. I want to know. Why do we care that something's red? <laughs> and, you know, very red. <laughs> And so naturally red. Unnaturally <laughs> red. What in nature is red or blue that you eat? Right. So putting those, t and, and kids with autism are so sensitive to chemicals. Mm. And so you put that in their food and they get that and that overstimulates them again. Aggressive behavior could be traced many times to different um, additives in processed foods okay. with, with that. And one that's kind of un uh, unique and unusual, I think, that most people don't think about, finally, with, with diet, and all these are mm -hmm. avoidances, things right. you need to avoid, would be soy. Oh, really? And you wouldn't think of that. No. You think it's a, it's a bean, and right. it should, or lentil, and it should be very healthy, healthy. But it has something called phytic acid in it, and it actually aggravates the lining okay. of the colon. And in, again, they're so sensitive, anything that is aggravating or irritating that is going to cause them to be a little more irritated gotcha. and a little more upset. Um, eventually causes leaky gut, which then causes some more autoimmune problems, which could cause pain like arthritis or okay. fibromyalgia. So just avoiding soy is just a good idea. Okay. There's also some supplements that we can touch on, and we always want to remind you to talk to your doctor before changing your child's treatment, diet, or lifestyle. We want you to work in partnership with the doctor that's already working with your child or, or your uh, student with autism, but there are some nice supplements that we see some good effects from. Absolutely. You know, the autism has been around, the first diagnosed case was in 1938. Mm. And since then, we still have not really discovered the cause of autism, you know, whether it's environmental, uh, which I tend to lean towards, um, or genetic. Okay. We do know 80% um, of our boys who are affected. Wow. Yeah, 80% are boys mm. that are affected with that. But uh, with that, we do know there are special herbs and supplements that really make a huge difference mm -hmm. in their life. So for the number one thing that I will put my autism kids on, first and foremost, is something with EPA and DHEA or fish oil. Okay. It's good essential fatty acids. Those omega-3s will go in and our brains are fueled by omega-3 fatty acids. Mm -hmm. That's the fuel that makes us think. So if we want the brain to be processing the best we possibly can, you put them on some omega-3s, and even little ones, they make gummies now that have omega-3s in them. The quickest difference I see is when they're on omega-3s. Okay. As far as behavior, um, attitude, learning, it affects all of those things. It's just critical for brain function. Um, it also reduces a lot of their symptoms and improves learning, particularly in focus and attention. Um, next, are, uh, we've talked a little bit about the digestion, mm -hmm. uh, how leaky gut, how soy, cheese makes a big difference, digestive enzymes. Oh. Something as simple as some papaya or mint have bromine in them and taken with meals. Uh, again, they're chewable, available for all, all ages of children. will help them make sure they're absor absorbing all their nutrients in their body that they need. And we've seen kids who prefer not to do, you know, to eat the good things. But when they do, if they're getting all the nutrients, then they, we know they're going to do a better job with their learning. Sure. Um, vitamin D. Everybody in the world is yes. vitamin. At least in the United States, we're all vitamin D deficient. No. 
Um, and I just read a study out from the uh, Council on Vitamin D, which I didn't even know there was a Council on Vitamin D, but there is something for everybody. Uh, they have a foundation, and they've done a st uh, extensive studies and found that their recommendation that is everybody takes 5,000 IUs of vitamin D for three months and then have blood work done to test to where you are. But uh, I think it's because we're inside more. Right. Kids, especially these teenage group that we're talking about, mm -hmm. are on electronic devices yeah. indoors and they're not getting that vitamin D. Well, without vitamin D, one of the rain, main causes of seasonal affective disorder, sad, where you feel mm -hmm. sad and depressed and unhappy, is not the vitamin D. So you put having seasonal affective disorder on top of wow. um, all the issues with autism, you know, uh, vitamin D would be very critical. Great tips here from Dr. Trudy Pieper. Uh, essential oils, uh, another thing that we can add into our, our repertoire. Well, it's very easy. Today, essential oils are available and more and more people are, are, are learning about them. Right. Um, I find it's just easy to take essential oil, um, put mix it with a carrier oil, which is like a little olive oil. Sure. Usually it's like a, a 10 to 1 ratio, one drop of the essential oil to 10 drops of a carrier. Okay. And you can pretty much rub that any place you can hold, get a hold of that child onto their body and it's going to be fine. Bottoms of the feet are good. Yeah. Um, but we found lavender is very calming. Okay. Frankincense actually helps the neurological um, part of the brain and uh, will help them with the development and thinking process. Okay. So that's frankincense, which is biblical. Very. And uh, one of my favorites for focus and attention is grapefruit oil. Oh, really? So sometimes if you can take a little grapefruit oil and even put it on their clothing, on the collar mm -hmm. of their clothing when they go to school, it will help them stay more focused at school. All right, good tips for uh, helping our children with autism. Dr. Trudy Pieper, you can see her office there in Johnstown, Ohio, the Phoenix Wellness Center. And you can see her online at phoenixwellnessforyou.com. Thanks so much for your time here on Faith and Friends. It's been called a crisis, it's been called an epidemic, words that perhaps are thrown around so often we are deadened to the meanings behind them. But we're talking about the opiate problem throughout really the entire country. It's no longer a city problem, it's not a country problem, it's not a rural problem, it's not an urban problem, it's a problem facing all of us. We're joined now by Dr. Trudy Pieper to talk about uh, the opioid problem and the fact is there are some really staggering statistics out there about this growing issue. It's amazing. Um, Painkiller overdose kills more than one American every hour of every day. I mean, that's just huge. The CDC is so concerned about it that they're saying that the prescription um, overdose is epidemic. 46 people a day die, and the treatment has actually become the problem. When you have pain and when it runs to get a painkiller, and what they've noticed is that when pain prescriptions go up, deaths also go up. Uh, the opiates kill as many people as heroin and cocaine combined. 250 million prescriptions uh, for the painkillers are given out every year. 250 million. That means every adult person in the United States can have their own bottle of painkiller. Um, the 10 highest prescribing states are found in the South, Alabama, Tennessee, and West Virginia. But those of us in the Midwest are not exempt. We're the next three. Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan give out someplace between 100 and 143 prescriptions for every 100 people. Uh, it continues to grow. I think the common drugs that people are most familiar with are methadone, oxycodone, and hydrocodone. Um, the emergency rooms are laden with 1,000 people each day per emergency room uh, come in because of pain reliever overdose. Over two million people are d determined to be addicted or dependent upon the painkillers, and overdoses and deaths have quadrupled since 1999. You know, and we hear about this, and I think a lot of people, the, the thought is, oh, well, you know, prescription drugs, well, it can lead to other things, but what the stats are telling us is that it's deadlier to be addicted to painkillers to prescription drugs than it can be to heroin or cocaine. Exactly. There are more people who die from that than the, the, the other two together. Um, it is, it, it, we, it's, we've gotten very convenient. Um, every ill ache and pain, we want to have a painkiller. We run to the doctors, they prescribe them. Uh, the drug companies are glad to accommodate that. But at the end of the day, it is not helping us, it's not helping our body. And the addiction to that, uh, in addition to the harm it's doing to the body, is, is, is just terrific with that. And it's unnecessary. 
And you, you look at the fact that you've got doctors who are overprescribing, you've got the so-called pill mills that are, are making plenty of money off of this. So it, it's a cycle between the two, those two organizations that are really killing people. They are. Um, and we need to turn that around. And that's the great news, that there are a lot of natural things you can do that will stop pain in your body. Um, just a, a knowledge about that and keeping it on hand. One really easy is white willow bark. And um, I always laugh because I, it's very similar. You see dogs chewing bark. Now, why is that dog chewing the bark? Do they you know, want to play with it? No, because bark has saccharin in it, which is the ingredient in aspirin. So they're really getting pain relief naturally from the bark. So getting white willow bark, which is the original aspirin, is overall, for any kind of overall pain reliever, it's great, and it doesn't affect the stomach like aspirin does. Meadow sweet is another very common. It helps with digestive pain, arthritis, and if you have a fever, it'll bring down your fever. Kava kava is used as a muscle relaxant. Devil's claw is both pain and inflammation for joints, but it has a great affinity for back. And back problems are huge today. Uh, if you're having back problems, devil's claw is something you should keep on hand and use per bottle ingredients. And then St. John's Ward, if you're having nervous tension, you got a nervous tension headache, or you've noticed it in your neck, or you're holding it in your shoulders, a little St. John's Ward will probably take care of that. There are, as you just detailed, several herbal solutions. What are some other ways uh, we can get around this opiate problem? Well, and, and another, there's two more herbs I like to mention because they're the most powerful. And if you want to compare apples to apples as to what will do the equal the opioids, um, the first one is curcumin. Mm -hmm. And this is just, a, you can find this in most homes. It's a spice that people use. Uh, it's an ingredient found in turmeric. And it is a powerful antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. Um, a recent study found that if you use one to three grams, now a teaspoon is a gram, worked better for pain than the prescription opioids with no side effects. It helps with general aches and pains, arthritis, neuropathy, exercise-induced pain, fibromyalgia. The key to it is that you want to make sure you spread it out throughout the day. Uh, I think in a powder form is better than in a capsule form. But you need to have it with black pepper because that speeds the results up. And another one that's really um, very effective is Boswellia. It's uh, a unique pain rem remedy because of its ability to af affect the 5-LOX LOX pathway of inflammation. And that's an analog that causes inflammation and has causes direct pain. You see that a lot in arthritis and irritable bowel and autoimmune. Um, drugs like Lyrica, there's over 100 drugs that will do that, but probably Lyrica is one that most people are familiar with. That Boswellia worked better in studies than any of those drugs did. It improves the blood flow, and it takes about 1,000 milligrams per hour through the day to accomplish that. So what you're saying is that if you're facing at home some sort of pain management issue, and your doctor wants to put you on an opioid, there are some other options that are all natural and in the long term probably healthier. It is, uh, the herbs, and in addition to that, one of the main causes of pain is dehydration. We, with all the caffeine drinks and the things that we drink each day, take into our bodies, America's dehydrated. So maybe just by increasing your fluids and making sure that you're getting 32 to 48 ounces of water each day, you would notice, you will notice that your pain is less. And another thing is we're so underactive. Blood flow. Um, each one of these herbs I've talked about increases blood flow to the body. The more blood flow, the less pain you have. So the more active you have, the less pain you have. So getting out and taking a walk may be a better choice than taking a painkiller. And I think that also goes hand in hand with another aspect that as much as we want to prescribe something, a lot of times it comes down to some lifestyle choices. It is. Um, it, we're the only country in the world that depends upon drugs. Uh, the majority of 80% of the world uses herbs or lifestyle changes for their main health care system. So um, I think that in America it's too easy and we grab it and we think our insurance is going to pay for that. Long term though, these drugs besides become addiction, they're foreign objects in your body. Your body's not used to them and that triggers your immune system to have to attack them. So as they're attacking them, that lowers the immune system, which means now you're going to be more susceptible to colds and flu and other illnesses because you're taking these drugs. 
All right, thank you very much, Dr. Trudy Pieper. Some certainly eye-opening statistics about the growing opioid problem and some ways we can have solutions that are all natural. Of course, for more information, you can go to her website, phoenixwellnessforyou.com. Thanks for joining us for this week's edition of Faith and Friends. We'll see you again next week. And one final reminder that auction donations are accepted Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. We appreciate your prayers during this process. Jennifer especially appreciates them as she and Michelle Brockert are working hard on this year's auction once again. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you.